Those do go through local compression cycles as the wheels roll, creating rapid changes in density. The Woodward transient works out to be negative, so the reaction force induced against the tire rotation is directed upward. And so in the reference frame of the car, the wheels spin, they generate an inertial reaction at every point on their rims. The road rolling by at a speed that matches the wheel rotation, remember we're still using the car's inertial frame here, compresses the contact point, creating a Woodward inertial transient for each segment of the wheel as it comes into contact with the road. This transient is large and negative and increases as the fourth power of the car's speed. According to Woodward's equation, a typical 1900s vintage car with solid tires should have launched itself into the air once it hit a speed of four miles per hour. At best, this indicates that the Woodward effect is weaker than the equation suggests, which, in fairness, does correspond to some of the uh, results Woodward has gotten. They've noted a smaller inertial transient than the equation as written at face value. Um, hello? Thank you. Another route to uh, propellantless propulsion is the manipulation of gravity. Now, we've seen Einstein's field equation for gravity before, and I want to concentrate on the source term, which is called T mu nu. It's called the stress energy tensor. In addition to energy, it contains terms for momentum, energy and momentum flux, pressure, and shear. Uh, now, a question, does pressure have inertia? Einstein's equals mc squared was basically a demonstration that energy has inertia. You can write it as m equals e over c squared. It's not immediately obvious whether Einstein's proof applies to all terms in T mu nu or only to the energy terms. So for the moment, we're going to assume that the pressure terms in T mu nu don't add to inertia. Then we can decouple inertial mass from gravitational mass. Inert internal pressure will make an object create a stronger gravitational field without changing its inertia. Now, briefly discussing the nature of gravity, force, and acceleration in, relativi in general relativity. Gravity is not a force. Gravity is space-time curvature that makes a free trajectory look to a distant observer as if it's accelerating. Right now, you're sitting still on Earth. The surface is forcing you to accelerate away from the curved space-time path that leads downward toward the center of the Earth. Your weight is an inertial reaction force. There's a natural free-fall trajectory that leads downward. There's a non-gravitational obstacle forcing acceleration away from that free-fall trajectory, this imposed acceleration. And there's an inertial reaction, which we call weight. So now let's look at a couple of spheres in empty space. They each have their own mass, and we're holding them apart mechanically with a strut that has negligible mass, and we're just using it to impose a non-gravitational acceleration on the system. Specifically, we're using it to hold these things at rest when they want to accelerate towards each other. So the imposed accelerations are different, assuming that m1 is not the same as m2. But the inertial reaction force turns out to be the same, because this in th this acceleration is proportional to m2, the mass is m1, you get gm1 m2. Down here, acceleration proportional to m1, inertial mass of m2, you've got gm1 m2 again. The inertial reaction forces exerted on the strut are identical. Everything's in balance, nothing's going anywhere. Now let's pressurize m1, keeping its mass the same. By hypothesis at the moment, the pressure won't increase M1's inertia, but will strengthen its gravity. Now, this imposed acceleration has become bigger. This inertial reaction has become bigger. This one is still the same, because pressure does not contribute to inertia, we're assuming. The forces are out of balance, and the whole system's going to accelerate. Unfortunately, gravity is a weak force to begin with, and it takes a lot of pressure to rival the gravitational effect of mass. There's a factor of c squared involved. The strongest materials available, uh, currently known, compressed to just short of their yield strength, will have a pressure contribution to their gravity of about uh, 10 to the minus 11th. That's 10 parts per trillion. The unbalanced gravity drive at this level 
will accelerate at five times 10 to the minus 17th meters per second. Uh, that actually depends on the total mass of the system, so I'm, I'm throwing in an assumption that you, you don't want to try to build a spacecraft that weighs more than a few tens of tons. Um, now that's 10 orders of magnitude better than the last one we looked at, but it still needs to run 73 days to travel one millimeter. Uh, now, we've been supposing for a while that pressure doesn't have inertia, but suppose it does. Um, then the unbalanced gravity drive doesn't work because the extra gravity source has its own inertia. Inertial mass and gravitational mass stay coupled. But this uncouples inertial mass from energy content mass. And this should sound familiar because it means you can change inertia without changing the energy content mass, the amount of stuff, if you will, in an object. A self-contained pressurization system won't change the total energy content, but it can still add or remove pressure. If pressure has inertia, we can manipulate the inertia of objects on the rim of a ro rotating wheel. Now, once again, <laughs> with the best available materials, this version of the inertial wheel could accelerate at nearly uh, I won't recite all the zeros. This is half a microgravity. Um, that's 11 orders of magnitude better than the unbalanced gravity drive. So one way or another, it looks like we have uh, inner violation of momentum conservation. If the pressure terms in the stress energy tensor contribute to inertia, then we can build an inertial wheel drive. If they don't contribute to inertia, we can build an unbalanced gravity drive. So now we'll go farther out into speculation. For somewhat over 40 years, physicists have speculated about tachyons, hypothetical particles that always move faster than light. They're a marginally respectable topic in rea relativity, and they're an abomination in quantum field theory. Although they're consistent with relativity and respect conservation laws, their FTL movement means that, like non-relativistic interactions, they can create the local appearance of non-conservation. So some properties of tachyons. This factor, square root of 1 minus v squared over c squared, is uh, ubiquitous in relativistic transformations. And if v is bigger than c, it becomes an imaginary value, which is why it's usually considered to be meaningless to talk about having something move faster than light. Uh, however, if the rest mass of an object is also imaginary, the imaginary factors cancel, and the mass, momentum, and total energy of such a particle become real values as long as it keeps moving faster than light. Fundamentally, you get three kinds of particles. We already, we're, we're made of particles that are sometimes called tardions, so we know they exist. Um, we interact with massless particles all the time, uh, so we know that there's no barrier to interactions between two different kinds of particles on this chart. Tachyons, if they exist, would simply add another category that uh, covers the remaining velocity regime. We've got always slower than light, we've got always moving at the speed of light, we've got always moving faster than light, and all of them have uh, real total energy. Um, now, both tardions and tachyons gain energy and momentum as they approach the speed of light. Um, now, as they slow to rest, tardions lose all of their momentum, but still have a minimum energy, their, their rest mass and its associated energy content. Now, moving close to the speed of light, tachyons look similar, but as they accelerate to faster and faster speeds, they do something different. It's their total energy that goes to zero and their momentum that goes to a minimum value. So in terms of space drives, a tachyon would be a something for nothing particle. You can create, if you can create them in the infinite velocity state, the instantaneous propagation state, they have zero energy and non-zero momentum. You can generate thrust while expending no energy. Uh, that same zero energy state is why quantum theorists hate tachyons. Any theory that allows tachyonic states predicts an infrared catastrophe where infinite numbers of zero energy tachyons get generated. 
The reason string theorists require extra spatial dimensions is to prevent any string states from being tachyons. If you try to uh, do string theory in just the four dimensions we think we know about, uh, you discover that, that the lowest energy string state is a tachyon, and this makes field theorists very, very unhappy. 